I'm very happy to welcome everyone back to Razmafsar TV. Uh, I'm having Beat here, and we are going to talk about uh, Sassanid archery because we wrote some time ago an academic article in a peer-reviewed journal, Rama, in Uni Universidad de León in uh, Spain, University of León in Spain, and we published there, Beat and I, and we are going to talk about the techniques used by Sassanids and what we see in Sassanid draw and what it means and what it is. So welcome, uh, welcome Beat back to our TV channel. Hi Beat, how are you? Oh, I'm very well, thanks. Okay Beat, we started to work on Sassanid draw and we all know these beautiful Sassanid silver tra uh, tra um, trays and also Sassanid mm -hmm. kings shown like that. And then, yeah. first of all, let us start with the drawing hand, and then we can go to the bow grasp, how it is the bow grip is yes. grasped. Let's start with the drawing hand. What is it? What is it, Beat? Well, based on the silver plates and the ones that we identified as genuine and the dates that we were able to follow, they all show some things in common. There's also uh, a, a hunting scene um, uh, of uh, Husra Paviz um, carved on the wall, um, which, uh, which also shows uh, that draw um, much later than the, the most of the early silver plates anyway. The silver plates were made over a long period of time, centuries. We don't even know why. And a lot of them turned up in, in the strangest places uh, in uh, uh, certainly uh, on the northern steppe, um, uh, up into the, I think I into the tiger areas, also uh, out in um, in the northeast, uh, in, uh, in I think in Gilan they found some. Um, so these these are found all around the edge of uh, of the Persian Empire, and and possibly they were diplomatic gifts by the Sasanian court. Um, and possibly they were highly prized and were then kind of traded on or given on or stolen. Uh, there were lot, lots of warfare on the, on the peripheries of the Sassanid Empire. Um, what they show consistently is the hand is always vertical. That is, the, the palm is facing towards the body. The back of the hand is facing away from the body. Uh, they never show the thumb you can't see the thumb sticking up so the thumb must be folded in they show the middle two fingers retracted and they usually show where there is enough detail these two fingers kind of um spreading out a little bit um many years ago i started to investigate this as is this a real draw are we looking at is it just a convention or is it a real depiction of something. It's very difficult to tell when you're looking at ancient art, whether it's uh, attempting to portray a reality or it's got some other thing that's going on, um, whether it's it's a religious gesture or it's a, a um, uh, just a convention to show something else. Um, definitely, we've got to say these are not photographs. They are not realistic one-for-one one depictions of what was going on but some things can be extracted the two fingers struck me as interesting because if you think of it we know from from shami from um uh, bits of um mother of pearl carvings and that that were dug up there the parthians generally shot with three fingers um the two finger draw is basically the three finger draw with you taking away the index finger because um the advantages of moving the index finger out of the way is that you can do a longer draw on a short bow because the the what happens when you're doing a standard, uh, imagine this is the arrow, a, a standard uh, three finger draw, the, as the bowstring bends, it pushes the fingers together and that, are, that can affect what happens to the arrow. The arrow gets squeezed and pinched. And if you look at modern, um, say finger tabs for, uh, for um, Olympic archery, they often have a rigid piece in there to stop the fingers being pushed together. But if you use the two middle fingers, 
and the arrow is above the middle finger, then you don't have that problem at all. And it's actually quite easy to draw further. And you also um, have a faster release because instead of you've, you've moved 33% of the drag on the bowstring, it's gone. Uh, the other thing is that the tendons tend to work together on those two fingers. It's, it's, it's possible to move them separately, yeah. but it's not as easy as, say, the index finger is. You can, you can have your fingers in any position and move the index finger. The one problem that I found was as the bows got heavier, it was harder and harder to keep the thumb straight. And I think the reason they show the thumb straight is this is part of a thing to get a faster release. I think by by concentrating on keeping the middle, sorry, the little finger, the little finger straight, um, you are kind of preloading that spring to get the get the fingers out of the way of the bowstring. The other thing I found when I was trying this out was that if you were used to using a thumb ring, for instance. You could shoot this on the um, on the thumb side of the bow just as easily as you could shoot it on the other. And for a person like me that have been shooting with a thumb ring for 40 years, uh, it's quite hard to change my aiming method. Uh, so I, I could practice that and discover if the arrow released quickly, if there were other problems with it, without actually altering anything. However, we will go into this later. There are some problems with that approach, uh, which I didn't think of. The other thing uh, that um, practice taught me was the, the Sasanians wore a, a vertically mounted quiver on their belt. So when they drew arrows out, they would have drawn them straight up like that. Yes. And then flicked them onto the bow. Uh, you would have controlled them with a the thumb and index finger, maybe even like the later um, um, times you'd, you'd put the middle finger under. You could knock without looking. Once you have the arrow on the string, you can just flip those two fingers under and draw. So it's a very fast method. It uh, uh, most modern archers, you'll see them. They they put they look down at the bowstring and they put the arrow on like this. Um, they they used to call it close peg method. It's like the old fashioned close pegs that you uh, pin clothes onto a clothesline with. Uh, for the modern generation who only know about clothes dryers, this is totally obscure. But this looking while you're knocking is the most dangerous thing you can do in battle. Because when you're not looking at your enemy, your enemy can strike you, whether with an arrow or charge you with a lance or hit you with a sword. So you've got to actually be focused on your potential target. So therefore, this method was very, I mean, it's just a little flick to get the fingers in place. Yeah. The Sasanians in, in the late Roman works are, are praised for their fast shooting. Yeah. Um, and I, whereas I'm not 100% convinced that fast shooting per se was important, I'm very convinced that fast shooting per arrow was important. The fact that you didn't waste time, you didn't fumble, you didn't, I mean, if you're sitting on a horse, now we know the Sasanians from these silver plates and from their rock carvings used saddles that were somewhat similar uh, to Roman saddles and Celtic saddles, uh, not very similar to Scythian, Sarmatian uh, or, or step people saddles, which were a different design. Yeah. But these saddles held them fairly firmly. They were a, a good thing. Uh, they had they had little wings in front that went over the um, the thighs, something like an Australian stock saddle, and and little supports at the back. So they they had a good solid seat. So on horseback, um, they were probably quite, you know, in control of what was going on, drawing up on and to full draw in a, in a very quick sequence of motions means that you can take you know, advantage of the opportunities. If you're a cavalryman charging at the enemy uh, from your maximum effective range to when you've got to turn around and get out of there, 
you only can shoot about three arrows, but you've got to be fast to get those three arrows off. And the faster you can get to full draw, the more time you have to actually aim. And I'm not talking about just geometric aiming, but this whole instinctive aiming, whatever you're doing, to get your focus on who you want to shoot. Uh, when you're harassing an enemy and you're riding past, um, then you're shooting at the mass of people. But when you're charging, I mean, I must point this out, even though you're aiming at a given person, if you hit the guy next to him, that's just as good. And if you hit the person behind him, that's just as good too. You're, you're trying to disrupt your enemy's line. You're, uh, unless you've been told by your commander to go and kill that guy with the red flag because we, we know he's causing trouble, uh, most of the time you're just shooting at whoever's in front of you. And, and this draw on the plates, now it's important to note that we, we noticed this immediately was that there are almost no plates showing what you would call warfare. They're all showing hunting. Yes. And they're all showing, uh, and the things that people are hunting, the kings are hunting, are uh, everything from um, uh, uh, things like chamois and, and, and these kind of rock climbing goats to lions. To, you name it, any anything you could imagine, wild ball, things that are either really hard to shoot because they're very fast and difficult, like uh, antelope and things like that, or things that are really dangerous to shoot because they can kill you. Yeah, of course. So the king is showing, well, the, the, the palace or whoever organized this place is showing, the king's really good at this stuff. And we're all you know, really good at this stuff, so don't mess with us. Even though it's not a battle, see, if you gave someone a plate with a battle on it, that was a very aggressive thing to do. Yes. But if you give a plate with somebody hunting, you're showing the same skills, yes. but you're not, it's not as aggressive. It could be just saying, oh, well, the, if you ever visit us, we'll take you on a hunt and everybody will have a good time. <laughs> but at the same time, it's saying, we're really good at this stuff. <laughs> True. <laughs> Absolutely. So, uh, but th there's there's another thing that that probably should be emphasised um, is that it's not this kind of draw. It's way back. the The shortest draw you see in some of the plates is just behind the ear, yeah. so that the hand it hasn't cleared the the back of the neck. It's 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 up there, and the um the longest one it's it's the the upper arm the shoulders and the and the bow arm are all in a straight line yes. which is the most powerful draw you can have because you you're not using your your muscles to hold the bow you're using your skeleton to hold the bow in place so it and means that, that be just to clarify it for our viewers because so many people ah, oh, it's like mediterranean draw it is not right because a Mediterranean no. draw is, doesn't look at, at that. You don't, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, please help me. Mediterranean draw does not um, draw like that. It, it, so extended. No, well, there, there were long, I mean, the, the Parthians used the Mediterranean draw and they, they, they did draw quite a ways back. But there's a disadvantage with the Mediterranean draw when you get too far back. Because you tend, your shoulders tend to come in then, which brings your hand well, it brings your elbow behind your head. And there's a, when you have a Mediterranean draw with all three fingers, when you let go, the string is coming off towards your face. Yes. And um, with a powerful bow, that can give you a, an awful slap. <laughs> and it also disturbs the, 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 the knock of the arrow on the path of the string because it's getting deflected on your face. So... Uh, if you, if you look at, say, um, English warbow shooters, where they do have a long draw with a, um, with a Mediterranean release, they don't go that far back. They're there. Yes. Which is about the optimum place with a three-finger draw, so you don't whack yourself in the face and you don't deflect the arrow. But you still need the arrow close into you, or you need your shoulders aligned to give you something to get consistent shots with so that all the arrows go the same way at the same speed the the two finger release i find and i've been trying this out you know that little exercising device it's a great way of testing out yes 
how it feels. And you can do it in front of a mirror facing the mirror without the fear of actually shooting the mirror. Because <laughs> if you make a mistake with that, it's just a big elastic band and it's going to hit you. But if you make a mistake with a bow and accidentally let go, then the bow may explode and, and there'll be broken bow and broken glass everywhere. And it's not a good thing. So, uh, but using that, I can stand in front of the mirror and see yeah. where my shoulders are precisely and then see where the hand is. Now, if you lift your hand too high, the hand wants to flatten out and that's the position that you would use a thumb ring in. But if you're down like just at mouth level down to about chin level, it works really well. Yes. And it's quite consistent. And, I mean, consistency in archery is, is incredibly important because if you're not consistent, you can't predict where the arrows are going to go. Can I say that the Sasani draw, it, it's like later, I mean, as far as the arrow is kept, where the arrow is kept, it is in the same line as Borut Kesh, mustache draw, the line? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I would say from Borut Kesh down to, you know, the corner of your jaw there? I would say there was a range where it's effective. Do you remember what we found in one of our archery manuals? Rishkesh, mm. beard draw. Do you remember the differentiated <laughs> between Borutkesh and Rishkesh? Do you remember? <laughs> yeah. you Actually, know? I was looking at that about, uh, about <laughs> yeah. half an hour ago. Um, so, yeah, this is, this is the thing. The, the, um, in modern times, like in the 20th century uh, in Mongolia, people were drawing like this. And then they were drawing like this, so the arrow was there. And then nowadays they draw like this. And I was talking to a Mongolian professor about it, and he said, well, after the Cultural Revolution in China, our access to good quality bows had declined. So we, um, we had to drop our hand lower to get the same distance, change the angle of takeoff. And recently, over the years, the bows have got better, and we're going back to where we were in the beginning. <laughs> And I, I, that, that's, you know, that's, that's an anecdote about them. But what it means is that when you see somebody drawing down there, assuming they are drawing a good strong bow, it means they're shooting for distance. Yes. And they're trying to get the arrow to go as far as they can get it to go. This is um, like the Sine Kesh in Persian tradition, right? Chestral. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Because these things, it's not everything is done one way all the time. Yes. The, all of the manuals stress how if you've got a different shaped body or different arm length or something, you've yeah. got to shoot a different way. Yeah. And, and I, was, I was training someone the other day and, and they have very long arms, very long fingers, and you just make adjustments yes. for their body. And then when you get it right, they can tell you because the difference in feeling from when you aren't balanced and when you are balanced is enormous. And, yeah. and even a beginning archer, or this, the, my, my student at the moment is not a beginning archer. He's, he's done regular recurve shooting for, for a while. But you can feel it. Yeah. It's a really positive reinforcement that you've got things in the right place. Yes, absolutely. Um, B, do you have this device you made for Sasani draw? Exactly. Could you show it? I mean, it's wonderful because uh, just for our viewers, B made one for me as well, and it really feels good to do this draw. Please explain this to us for us, please. Well, basically, I'm not sure whether the Sassanids would have used a tab like this or whether they would have had two little finger stalls there. The reason I'm not sure is because the original three-finger shooting in the Middle East, going back to the eighth or yeah, about the eighth century BC, because there's a there's from southern Turkey, northern Syria, there's a place called Zinjili, and they they actually found a rock carving of someone walking along with three little finger stools on a triple strap that obviously went on their wrist, just hanging loose, and their bracer. So. I mean, we knew that what we would consider totally modern um, uh, finger stalls were being were in use for thousands of years. With the Sasanians, this locking these two fingers together, so you don't have the arrow between those two fingers, the arrow is above them. And this is pretty clear from all the silver plates. 
um, the arrow is never shown between the fingers. So either it was put there or we can't make any determinations. So what you often see is you see on the, the back of the hand, you see a little disc and the straps forming an X where two legs of the X go between the index finger and the middle finger and the little finger and the ring finger. Yeah. Um, there is no indication of a strap around here. So what I did was I just made an X-shaped strap and I, um, I put a buckle on the end. I don't know how well we're going to see this because it's hard to do the buckle up and talk about it at the same time. It uses two different parts of the brain, I think. <laughs> um, and um, what happens is, once you've got it straightened out, you don't actually need any other strap except for that little buckle there. And it's it holds the, the tab in the right place. If there were two finger stalls there, it would hold them in the right place as well. The reason that I chose a tab was because as the two fingers are moving together, there's no need for them to be separate. And I tried this out holding a sword and everything. You don't have to take this off to use a sword. No. Uh, and uh, so therefore, th that's perfectly acceptable. It gives you the position. Um, so yeah. everything, you know, is moving together in the right way. It's very simple to make. This is one single strap of leather with a buckle at one end passing through a concho. And I just sewed the flap. It's just a single piece of leather sewn together to make a little channel for the strap to go through. It's very simple. You can vary the thickness of the leather. You can vary the length. You can do lots of things. I actually made one uh, for practice that doesn't even have this strap assembly. It's just a tab with a hole through it big enough to put your two fingers in. <laughs> and uh, it's quite good for practice drawing. I don't think it's any good for shooting because I think eventually it would pull off. But I'm going to make one for shooting and test it out just to find out. But this, this is clearly close to what they had. You will see um, other reconstructions of this, which for a thumb draw, trying to explain why these are there, they've got multiple little straps in here to hold things in place. But there's no reason for it. Usually, in cultural things, this is not 100% true, but usually the simplest explanation is the correct one. Um, culturally, you can have um, reasons for doing things that don't actually make sense unless you know the history of the object. So, you know, that, I, I, I admit that. But this, you can wear it all, all the time. It doesn't get in the way. I mean, it'd be a bit difficult to play the piano, but they didn't have piano, so that's OK. Um, I have a There's question another... for you. Be yes. it, could it be a twisted thumb draw? Could it this I be thought, a... Yeah, I thought about this uh, for a long time. I tried it out. There's a, there is a thumb draw that uses this, uh, this finger. Actually, there's two. Uh, the first one I became aware of is the Yahi Indian draw, um, where the, the, the uh, it doesn't work as well when using this, but when, where the um, middle finger holds the thumb down. Yes. And uh, see, so the problem with that drawer is where the string goes in. Now, um, the, the person that did this actually held his bow that way. And the, his drawer was suited to his thing. He only drew about to here. Um, he was a consummate archer, a hunter, a, a brilliant hunter. Um, and he was the last of his people. So he, he deserves a lot of respect for being willing to pass these ideas on. But it's, it was in, in 1910 in um, Oregon on the Western States, United States. There's no chance that this could have been transmitted. Or this could be a common thing. This is, this is something somebody developed for a particular style of archery that's nothing like Sasanian archery. It's not a war archery, it's a hunting archery. It's for short draws because they had worked out a, a lot of Native American tribes, develop, uh, particularly in the um, western half of the con continent, developed short draw shooting for various reasons. Uh, and it's very practical, very good for hunting, very fast. Uh, so, but it's not the same thing as what was going on in Asia. The other 
thing is that uh, there is a, a method in in uh, uh, a Tang book from China yeah. called the Wang Zhu method because Wang Zhu was the the author of the book. Well, he was the author of the original book that got accretions and accretions and accretions for centuries afterwards. Back in this would be um, around about the time of the fall of the Sasanian dynasty. But his system was entirely different. He put his index finger on the string. Yeah. He put his uh, his uh, middle finger on the thumb, and his draw was kind of like that. And as the string was drawn, the index finger came down. It yeah. would not have looked like the Sasanian draw from the side, and it was a very peculiar draw for the best. I mean, normal thumb ring draws go back in China to at least the 11th century BC because that's the earliest thumb ring that's been published, um, belonging to a lady general of the Shang dynasty who was known as Fu Hao. And it, it seems unlikely that Wang Zhu's method was more than just a, a blip in Chinese archery. It certainly didn't have any Sasanian connections. Um, the other thing about drawing like this, it's, it's, a, it's a weak draw for a thumb draw um, because your thumb has to bend a lot further round. Yeah. It's not like it, when it's against the, the, the middle finger like that, the, the, the uh, bones of the thumb are fairly much in alignment. But if you if you put it under the middle finger, then it's it's twisted round. It also cuts back the space for the string. If you, I mean, particularly if you put both fingers over it, you've got to actually turn the hand to an uncomfortable position for the draw. It it works. You can do it. But since there's no evidence that they did it, and since all of the reconstructions to match this shape involve lots of other stuff here that you can't see. It's very unlikely.